Hello everyone, welcome to 21 Gems of Chess series. I am Grandmaster Priyadarshan Kanapan and this series is brought to you by Chess Gyan Academy and Follow Chess app. So we are now on day 15 of our 21 day series on the topic 21 Gems of Chess. We have covered so far so many legendary players over the past days and we are going to be looking at one another legend today also and the legend whose game we are going to look today is Alexander Kotov. So for people who don't um, know maybe a lot about Kotov, Kotov is a two-time world championship candidate and more than his playing he was well known for his books. The books that he has written in chess have made some of the biggest impacts and are even widely discussed and analyzed even to, to till date. So some of the, you know, the most famous books, if we have to say that he wrote is like, you know, think like a grandmaster, play like a grandmaster, train like a grandmaster. And he also developed something called the Koto syndrome, which more, many coaches would, you know, explain to you these days. It is that when someone thinks for a very long time in a position and then they are not satisfied with what uh, variations they have calculated and then they just play some random moves which is actually sometimes even worse than what they had calculated which would uh, most of the times be a blunder. So this syndrome is called the Kotov syndrome. So the game that today we are going to be talking about is from one of the candidates which he played. He played the white pieces and his opponent is the well respected and well known Mark Taimanov and this is from the Zurich candidates in 1953. Kotov playing the white pieces and Taimanov has the black pieces. So before we get into the game, I just have a small announcement to make. So there is a Blitz tournament that is being organized by my academy, Chess Gyan. The tournament is on April 13th and the total prize fund is Indian rupees 56,000 with the first prize of being 10,000 rupees. And the tournament is on April 13th, which is a Monday at 8 to 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And you can find all the other information about the tournament on the uh, description of this uh, in the YouTube description of this video so let's get back into the game so white started off with c4 black went knight f6 g3 e6 bishop g2 d5 so we are kind of getting close to a catalan but white still has to decide if he wants to go d4 or not d4 would be, be a proper catalan if not d4 we may see some you know neo catalan or some sort of variations so white goes knight f3 and black decides that uh, he doesn't want to just transpose into a normal catalan so he goes d4 so now we may possibly see some sort of transposition to reversed uh, you know benoni kind of setups and most natural mode obviously be short castle if c5 then you know it can go e3 knight c6 e takes d4 and then kind of go cd4 d3 and as i said it's a reversed benoni kind of position but instead of this on move five white did not short castle play the most natural move instead white went for b4 an interesting move and uh, the question i would have to the audience is is bishop takes b4 playable i mean or is there any big trap behind it uh, and do you think that time and I'll play this move in the game so you will you should pause the video make that decision and then you know proceed forward with the video so now let's see what time and I'll play time and I'll play c5 in the game if bishop takes b4 was played it's actually very much a playable move it's not like a blunder or anything because after queen a4 check black has knight c6 and for knight e5 black has this nice move rook to b8 the point being if you play something like knight takes e6, b takes e6 and the rook is defending this bishop so uh, the bishop is not hanging and in case of something like bishop takes e6, b takes c6 and if knight c6 black can simply even play bishop d7 and pin the knight and queen so black is doing fine. So because of this for rook b8 if white does not capture on c6 but white can simply go something like bishop a3 bishop takes a3 knight takes c6 b takes c6 and knight a3 short castle and black is doing fine equals plus kind of position so if uh, i would strongly recommend that you could you know black could play bishop b4 here in this position but in the game time you know went for c5 and white went bishop b2 and it would be a very terrible idea for black to just capture the pawn because the central pawn after knight takes d4 capture you know this three pawns are far more valuable than 
you know black spawns on b4 b7 and so on as white has complete control of the central squares so for bishop b2 black went queen b6 and remember this game was played in 1953 close to 60 70 years ago and uh, this move was a novelty back in the day queen b6 was no one had tried before this game and for this white has two options one is white can simply go b5 and if a6 go a4 bishop d6 and a pretty normal position after short castles but in the game white went for queen b3 and the story still remains the same black cannot really capture on b4 because if he does he's hanging the d4 pawn which is very much in favor for white so black goes knight c6 b5 knight a5 so you see this knight going to a5 in a lot of, you know, some sort of King's Indian positions and uh, even here and some that structure. Always the one problem I had with this knight going to a5 is how will the knight get out? Like once pawn goes to b5 or let's say white goes d5 and attacks the knight and the knight goes to a5. And the same question arises to me here also because the knight cannot really go back to c6 unless the b5 pawn is removed. And the knight is not even really threatening to take on c4 because once white goes d3, c4 is so well protected. So the knight on a5 is a cause of concern for black in the long term. So black has to find some solutions for the knight to get it back into the game. If not, black is kind of playing like a piece down. So white goes queen c2, black goes bishop d6, white can short castle but instead white went for e3 first. And black went e5, e takes d4 and this is a critical decision moment for black in my opinion because which to recapture, e takes or c takes and you have to make a decision so pause the video, calculate some variations and you know choose which one would you play in a real game and then proceed further with the game video. So in this position, in the game, black captured with ed4. Uh, both the recaptures are fine. C takes d4 or e takes d4. It is a matter of personal choice and taste on what kind of position you want. If c takes d4, let's say, white would short castle, short castle, d3, bishop to f5. And, you know, black would be putting some pressure on this pawn and also on this pawn. And white goes knight bd2, strengthening c4, rook ac8, knight h4, bishop e6, a4, rook f8, and in a fairly unclear position on the board. On 11th move for ed4 in the game, Taimanov decided to take back with the e-pawn and keeping the structure symmetrical, uh, so that uh, symmetrical structure generally leads to higher possibility for a drawing chance. So for ed4, white short castle, short castle, and goes d3. So now again a critical uh, decision to make for black. Uh, the decision which piece to move is actually pretty straightforward, but where to place it is the big question. Like where would you place the c8 bishop? Would you go to d7 or e6 or f5 or g4? I mean you have a wide range of options here. And uh, as a black player, each move has its own advantages and disadvantages. So I would highly recommend you calculate the variations and then proceed with the video after you choosing which one you like the best and you would play. So we'll quickly look at uh, first bishop f5. This, in my opinion, is the worst move of all. The reason why, uh, I mean, the worst bishop move of the choices that I suggested, because I feel like once you go bishop f5, then bishop is actually not secure on f5. And white can gain one very critical tempo by going knight h4, attacking the bishop, and also at the same time he's activating his g2 bishop. I think this tempo could be very crucial for white in the long run. That's why bishop f5 is not my favorite. After knight h4, I think it's a plus equal position. And the other option is bishop g4, which is okay. But the problem is on bishop g4, the bishop is not really threatening bishop takes f3. And white simply goes knight bd2 to additionally defend f3. So what is the bishop doing? The role of the bishop on g4 is kind of questionable, as I don't really see a future for the bishop there. And the other option is bishop e6. But also at some point, white can go knight g5 kind of ideas, gain a tempo. So the safest developing square is obviously bishop to d7. And one additional benefit out of this is you are kind of putting some pressure, future pressure on this b5 pawn. And that could be helpful some time later in this game. So white goes knight bd2, h6, rook a, e1. And with this, white has officially completed all the pieces development. I mean, the rook was the last piece that was had not moved from its initial square. And black goes rook a, e8. So it's kind of well known the moment you have developed all your pieces, the next step is to regroup your pieces to good squares, you know, find them better squares and where they are. 
So if we make a kind of a survey of where which piece is in the worst P square, which piece could be improved, then clearly we can notice that this queen on C2, the bishop on B2 are not doing really much as there's not a lot of action on the queen side. And then the pawns being on D3, C4, B5 restrict, you know, white and also black pieces play. So white decides to go bishop c1. So he wants to activate this bishop on the dark squared bishop along the c1 hat 6 diagonal. And I feel like in this particular position, the first instinct move for a lot of players, especially if you play blitz, would be to just capture rook takes e1, rook takes e1 and go rook e8. And that's the most natural you know, instinct to come because we just swap the rooks and then we get a fairly equal position kind of what it looks like and black should be fine. So that's kind of the lazy thinking of how we approach the position or very quick thinking without spending enough time on the position. And that's what kind of I think uh, black also did in this position. Black did capture rook e1. So in, uh, rook e1 is actually a mistake. So what is a better move than rook e1 here? If we think about it, it is queen to c7 and then maybe go b6 then try to bring the knight back via b7 and so on would be the best option. Because if white wants to capture on rook 8, let him do rook e8 and go rook e1. Why does black have to capture on e1 and you know give white and technically an additional tempo? And I hope the audience calculates what happens after rook e1, rook e1, rook e8 and then proceed uh, the video here so once you have calculated you can continue watching the video from here on so black went rook e1 rook e1 and black played rook e8 so white now senses there is a you no know, opportunity it's a kind of a mixture of tactical and positional opportunity that's going to come up in the next two three moves for white so white captures rook takes e8 and black captures bishop e8 and the drawback of bishop e8 is this weakness of this f5 square. The bishop which was earlier controlling f5 is now no more controlling that. So white goes knight h4, activating his knight. He's going to land on that critical f5 square. And also at the same time, you know, the bishop is also activated from g2. So for knight h4, black plays a6. White goes a4, queen a7. And what would you play as white here is a question you should ask yourself because would you want to land your knight on that favorite square on f5 and put pressure on the bishop or do you have something even better? So white went knight f5 but I feel white could have played knight e4 and then the queen immediately kind of gets into e2 in like the next move and then you're putting pressure on here and knight f5 can land any time and put pressure on the d6 bishop. So white in the game though when knight f5, black pulled back his bishop to f8, then white when knight e4, knight takes e4, bishop e4. And now even though the material is equal, you see the difference in the quality of the pieces. So white's queen is going to go to e2, kind of control this e file, maybe go g4, put some pressure on the g7 pawn. But look at the black queen, it's so passive on a7. And look at the white knight on f5, you know, kind of a lot of ideas it's generating. Maybe knight had six check at some point, knight e7 maybe in the future, so on. But this knight on a5 is basically completely out of the game. Another big point to note. And then obviously we, we can compare the bishop. Look at how much of control the c1 bishop is exerting because there's always some bishop takes e6 kind of sacrificial ideas that it can play. Whereas the black bishop on f8 isn't doing much. It's just passively defending g7 hat 6. And the same goes for the e4 bishop also because the e4 bishop in comparison to the e8 bishop, that's a very critical central square that the bishop is occupying on e4. And from there it can kind of attack on the b1 hat 7 diagonal some mating threats is keeping an eye on the b7 pawn and also critically defending their finite for now so it, the white pieces are more cohesive as a unit they are playing well together that is black pieces are all like playing individual roles but are not coming together as a team yet so black goes b6 to kind of make some connection with the queen on a7 and the pawns on f7 g7 and white goes queen to d1 so a point to note is white did not go queen e2 and you may think what's the big difference between d1 and e2. The key idea being when you go d1 you are also still keeping an eye on the b3 square which is not the case when you go queen e2. Black may possibly think of most like knight b3 here. That is the very important uh, 
difference even though the idea of d1 and e2 is the same it is to go to g4 and generate attack on the black king so for queen d1 black plays a takes b5 and as you may have uh, seen few moves earlier after rook takes e1 i was mentioning that's going to be the most natural instant reaction and when someone plays a takes b5 here the immediate reaction more or less of everyone would be to go and capture a takes b5 but i would suggest the viewers to pause here for a minute or two calculate some variations what about c takes b5 why is a takes b5 better than c takes b5 or is that a third move or a third option that is even better than these two captures so if you can make this uh, calculation and figure out would be very great and that is actually a move that is even better than a takes b5 which was played by white here and that absolutely brilliant move would be to go queen to g4 and go after the black king right away the key idea is obviously knight takes h6 check is coming bishop takes h6 is coming so you're kind of putting a lot of pin on the king here and if black goes ba4 knight h6 checking h8 knight goes back f5 you're going to give a check on the h file and then most likely mate on h7 and black king will get checkmated if for queen g4 if black goes king h8 trying to step away from the g5 pin black can now go a b5 and uh, the Black has kind of made one more king a trade, uh, which was maybe not what he wanted to really do. So white kind of gained a tempo, critical tempo. In the game though, black, white went 25th move, a takes b5, white did not go 25 queen g4. And for a takes b5, black went bishop d7. So one of the problems that we see is why here uh, white should have gone directly gone queen g4 is that now you know black is kind of threatening to play bishop f5 if need arises. So this is one key difference which would have been if we had gone queen g4 without a takes b5 because that going bishop d7 would not have been an option for black. So for bishop d7 on move 25 white now goes queen h5 and here what is black really thinking that's a big question for us to ask i mean because there is a lot of pressure here on these pawns even on f7 now there is pressure i mean white may try to get some knight h6 check followed by queen f7 kind of moves so as black you got to figure out what you have to do so one option for black would certainly be something like knight b3 would be an option in the game black when bishop e6 g6 would not be an option because white can capture knight takes h6 with a check and if the king moves the black queen can uh, sorry the white king queen can go to h4 or so on so for queen h5 black decided to go bishop e6 and protect the f7 pawn even further more and here uh, white actually misses a very very nice calculated win here uh, Koto, I completely missed it. So if you're watching this video, pause the video, spend at least five minutes, calculate as much as you can as it's a tricky position. Even though I said there's a win here, you still have to calculate the variation and find out how to win. It, the win is not that straightforward here. Uh, and uh, so once you pause the video, calculate everything, you can resume back the video from this here. So in the game, white played bishop f4, which is where white misses a golden opportunity to kind of finish off the game. The win would have arisen after knight takes h6. So if you had calculated something instead of knight h6 like king g2, you're not wrong. King g2 still gives you an advantage, but it is not decisive. You are still improving your pieces one after another and you're at some point you have to break through. But king g2 is also a fairly good move for white. But the most crushing win for white is knight takes h6. Black obviously has to capture back g h6. White plays bishop takes h6. And here I think the key two variations are bishop takes h6 and bishop g7 for black. So let's start with bishop g7. If bishop g7, white can play bishop takes g7, king takes g7, queen g5 check, king f8, queen d8, king g7. So here does white have anything better than just repeating checks with queen g5, queen d8? And the answer is yes. White can just simply start pushing his king side pawn. So white can play h4 if knight b3. White can play queen g5 check if king f8. White can go queen f6. And the point being black cannot really go something like knight d2 or knight c1 because white has queen h6 check and pick up the knight on d2 and white would have two extra pawns. So for uh, instead of knight d2, if black goes queen a1 check. White can go king g2 and then white's simply going to start rolling his pawn forward h5, h6, h7 and black cannot really stop 
the pawn from going forward. So this is if 28th move, if black goes bishop g7. If black goes bishop takes h6 instead of bishop g7, then white simply captures back queen takes h6. And if knight b3, white goes king g2, queen d7, and now go g4. I think this is a bit critical move because black maybe is now threatening to go f5 kind of idea. That's the point of queen d7. So he's defending the e6 bishop. So the f pawn can be freely moved. And now g4 kind of stops that because of f5. Now white can simply play gf5, bishop f5, and think of queen g5 check and try to pick up the bishop on f5. So for g4, if black goes something like f6, let's say, then queen g6 check. King f8, queen takes f6 check, king queen f7, queen d8 check, king g7, queen b6, and white is basically going to win all the pawns on the board, and white should be able to convert that position. And also keep in mind the b5 is a far advanced past pawn, so even if queens get traded b6, b7, and white should still end up with few extra pawns. So one variation that I missed to comment is for g4, black, uh, cannot really play bishop takes g4 even though it looks like a free pawn because bishop had 7 check and then there is bishop f5 check and then the queen on d7 is hanging. So this is how uh, white could have simply won the game if he had spotted 27th move knight takes had 6 check which is an exclaim brilliant move in my opinion. Instead white went bishop f4 so white is kind of saying I'm still kind of building my attack you know and so on but this move gives black a golden opportunity to save the game. So if you're playing the black pieces it's very evident you have been under pressure for the last set few moves and now white gives you an opportunity to equalize the game where you can you know kind of get back into the game and try to force a draw and so on. So pause the video calculate that variation and then proceed forward. So here uh, in the game black played knight b3 which is a blunder because it doesn't really create any threats against the white king or against the white pieces that are aimed at the black king. Instead the best move for black would have been knight takes c4. So is this just a simple peace sacrifice or what is the point behind it? The logic is that after d takes c4, queen a1 check, king g2, bishop takes c4. Now bishop f1 or queen f1 check is being threatened. And uh, white has to play something like knight takes h6, g h6, queen g4. And white can repeat uh, queen, bishop g7, queen c8, queen g4 and force a draw he wants to. But uh, Taimano misses his chance to play knight takes c4. Instead Taimano goes knight to b3. And this move is not really dangerous at all. White can simply go king g2 and white has a huge advantage. Instead uh, Koto went back queen to d1. And here black played queen a2 defending the b3 knight. If queen a1 or so then white can simply capture and go bishop c7 and pick up the pawn on b6 and then the b5 pawn just rolls forward. So instead of queen a1, black went queen a2, and for this white went h4, so kind of clearing uh, more squares for his king to escape, and also stopping black from kind of playing g5 or so ideas. So for h4, black went knight a1, white plays h5, black went knight c2, and now white goes bishop e5. So white is not really interested in trying to even go after the b6 pawn, white basically wants to go after the black king. So for bishop e5, black went queen b2, and now white went bishop c7, knight a3, queen g4, threatening knight takes h6 check, queen c1, king g2, knight to b1, bishop to f4, knight to d2, and white simply goes back queen e2 here, and the knight on d2 is spinned, and black is going to lose the knight. So seeing this, black Mark Taino playing the black pieces resigned as he did not have any good option to continue the game here. So this game, uh, if we summarize it, it is more of uh, white actually not doing much. A lot of the problems that black faced was due to a bit carelessness by black, I would say. Like rook takes e1 capture and then going rook e8 and trying to swap both the rooks of the board. And also white st uh, black started a bit more riskier in the opening by going d4, c5, uh, some sort of a reversed, you know, Benoni setup. And in the end, when he was given an opportunity, he failed to find the correct defense with knight takes c4. The knight takes e4 move is not easy to find, but uh, for someone as, uh, for the caliber like Mark Taimano, I 
would guess that he can find a more like knight takes c4 on move 27. So these were the main reasons why black lost this game or Taimano lost the game. From white's perspective, white did all the basic things right. White developed his pieces, put them on active squares, and then gained a lot of space on the queen side with first pushing the pawn all the way up to b5, and then pushing uh, pawn on h to h5, and gaining space on both sides of the board. And white uh, just kept on exploiting black's mistake and white managed to win this game in a very nice manner so this is the game between alexander Korto and mark taimano from zurich candidates tournament 1953 so we still have six days more of grandmasters whose games we'll cover grandmasters are very strong legendary players who came very close to winning the world championship match but kind of fell short at the end so before we uh, sign off, uh, I have uh, two announcements to make. The first one is related to the tournament that is going to be held on April 13th. Uh, it's an online tournament in chess.com platform. So far, we have got three IMs and three GMs registered. So it's going to be an extremely strong one as the price money is 56,000 Indian rupees. And it's open for all players. Players from all countries can play. And the other announcement is that I'm doing a weekly YouTube live session. So that it's on every Wednesday and today is a Wednesday. So if you're uh, wanting to have a live free interactive session log on to my youtube channel the same channel that you're watching right now chess Gyan channel at uh, 7 pm and it'll be a live session where we will discuss about a game we can ask questions and uh, we you know there is learning uh, a lot of learning to happen today and if you are watching this game um and you want to see the PGN of the previous, you know, let's say you are, this is the first time you're watching this 21 Gems of Chess episode, and you want to see the previous day's PGN, you can find all of them in the Follow Chess app. And if you want to watch the video part of all the videos from the previous days of 21 Gems of Chess, all the videos are on the Chess Gyan YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So thanks everyone for uh, you know supporting this initiative. We are now in the third week of this initiative and uh, everyone stay safe, stay home wherever you are and uh, signing off as Grandmaster Priyadarshan Kandapan from Chess Gyan Academy. I will see you all uh, tonight at eight, uh, at um, tonight at 7 p.m. Indian time and tomorrow with a different Grandmaster game in the uh, 21 Gems of Chess. Bye-bye.